was a period of time at the tail end of the 1990s and the start of the 2000s that holds a special place in my heart and in my memory. I also think some of you out there may feel the same way I do. Nickelodeon was already in full swing. Many great cartoons and sitcoms helped make the network so great and nostalgic for those that grew up alongside it all. But the specific memories I want to look back upon today are that of Nickelodeon Gas. Gas stands for Games and Sports, but the name Gas as a kid was indeed hilarious. Nickelodeon Games and Sports was a side channel that Nickelodeon created that would offer much of what the main channel wasn't anymore. All of the game shows from Nickelodeon's past, and even more beyond this, would all find themselves a nice little home while the main channel strictly wanted to focus on their ever-growing slate of cartoons and sitcoms. I thought it would be fun to take a tour of what Nickelodeon Gas truly offered those who went over to that channel, and in all honesty, take a look throughout Nickelodeon's past, through the programs that were on Nickelodeon Games and Sports. We will also learn about how it all started, what happened to it, and why it no longer exists. So let's hop in our nostalgia-powered time machine and visit the year 1998 to start. 1998 serves as the birth of the Nickelodeon Games and Sports channel, at least conception-wise. On November 3rd, 1998, Nickelodeon officially announced the creation of this new channel with the aim that it would target specific interests in the realm of athleticism. In fact, Nickelodeon had been working for many months beforehand gathering data to see where the sports-related interests may lie. Aside from gathering and understanding whatever data they took into account, it was meant to be more than that, though. It was also trying to establish a branding of games children play, hence why the title is Games and Sports. The first initial focus that would be coming to the channel would be the game shows that showed you, as a kid, could potentially be a part of them. Game shows weren't just for your parents, now you would see kids your own age competing their way through guts, or running through the different rooms in Legends of the Hidden Temple, or answering trivia in various other game shows. It always looked like fun, and most importantly, if you were anything like me, you would watch all of these and point at the screen going, oh, I could do that. Now, regardless if I or you you actually could, you would just picture what you would do to win all of them. What would be my secret talent on Figure It Out so I can win all the prizes? How can I climb to the top of the aggro crag faster to win an actual piece of it as a trophy? Which team would you want to be on to make it to the temple and why was it always the orange iguanas? Aside from all of these wonderful game shows being brought over to the new channel, some other new content would be there as well, with things like Renford Rejects, a live action sitcom that was already premiering throughout 1998 in the UK. It would join on as a new show in the US and air on Nickelodeon Gas, as it fit the theme of what the channel was, with the show focusing on a school football team, no, not US football, as the kids who didn't make the actual school team formed their own. Nickelodeon seemed excited and eager to expand further with their children's entertainment, putting a lot of time into the focus groups both online and in person wanting to hear what the actual kids themselves wanted to see, what were they into, and what could inspire them further from the entertainment they consume. Overwhelmingly, kids wanted more sports media in every every aspect of the meaning. Scripted content, behind the scenes access, reporting, game shows, you name it. Nickelodeon believed in this heavily since they claim from their research that 95% of kids are already participating in some sort of sports related activity within their own local communities. So why not give them more of what they want? Sounds like a win-win scenario. So come 1999, Nickelodeon Gas was ready to officially launch. <laughs> March 1st, 1999, Nickelodeon Games and Sports flipped its activation switch on, but only premiered to somewhere under a million available watchers thanks to the different degrees of cable and satellite packages out there with differing amounts of channels available. We truly are in such a different age with how we can access content, I'll tell you what. This less than a million number was only a small fraction of the 70 million households with cable and satellite at the time. But this wasn't a bad thing in the eyes of Nickelodeon. Since gas was a part of the digital channel's labeled under the suite, only the initial limited amount of households could access the channel. But the at the time executive VP and GM of Nickelodeon, Sima Zargami, followed the trend, seeing how quick the expansion of channel capacity for the different providers was going, and having the forward thinking that this will bring more success for Gas's chances to grow over time. On the business side of things, Nickelodeon wasted no time in trying to make deals to secure some sports broadcasts to their system of networks, selling their namesake to back up the enticement factor of the deal, 
but making sure that Nickelodeon Gas was the channel that would be benefiting the most. They went after Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, and the NBA to get the ball rolling. No pun intended. The main pieces of content that Nickelodeon and Nickelodeon Gas would receive were stuff like shorts that would feature getting up close with the players and some exciting game footage, more specifically when it came to baseball, and exclusive Play of the Week highlight bits when it came to soccer. For basketball, the NBA would share access to their special NBA 2-Ball series, a version of the sport that would feature kids from the ages of 9 to 11, where the teams would only be two players each, where it was all about skills, what you can show off, whether it was shooting, rebounding, passing, dribbling, or anything else. Throughout the early days of Nickelodeon Gas, as well on Nickelodeon itself, they would show special bits of 2-Ball over the course of six weeks that led to a special full half-hour coverage called NBA 2-Ball at the finals. This, again, was still shared with the main Nickelodeon channel, but it became a good way to help advertise that there was another channel that could be accessed, or hopefully be accessed soon, for those interested in more content similar to this. One thing that they did do right off the bat was cast Tara Lipinski, an Olympic champion figure skater who would now commentate, break down, and report on sports as the channel's special sports news correspondent. So far, so good. The planning here for this network was looking to pay off, with the channel becoming a much sought-after choice for cable providers to want to add to their list of provided channels. The programming from the start was already a really great lineup of shows, so let's stroll through some of these memories together. Let's start off with Double Dare. I mean, come on, this show, and by extension, the various other versions that we will mention later on, were just classic. Originally, the game show hosted by Mark Summers first aired on Nickelodeon all the way back in late 1986. The setup was simple. There were two teams with two players on each side. The show itself would end up being syndicated around, growing a larger audience and helping aid in bringing new versions of Double Dare to the masses, like Super Sloppy Double Dare, which was just a messier version of the same game, and Family Double Dare, which is a pretty self-explanatory version, but we shall get into those in a bit. Double Dare would start right away, having the teams compete in a physical challenge, where the winning team would lead the start of the game and gain control of the first official round. We then jump to a bit of trivia as the contestants of the winning team would earn points for getting answers correct, but if they got the answer wrong or ran out of time to respond with an answer, the other team would get asked the questions instead. Now, and here's the part where the name of the game kicks in, you could take the question given to you and dare the other team to answer it, making the points double. But on top of that, that team can then double dare them back, making the points four times greater, and then that team is forced to either come up with a response, or they can make things fun and take the physical challenge option instead. If they were to attempt to answer the question and got it wrong or not answer it in the time given, all the points as well as control of the game would go to the opposite team. So most times, the physical challenge was the better way out of this sticky situation, and you'd put yourself in a different sticky situation because these challenges were iconic for being messy. Whatever the episode's physical challenges were would always involve some sort of mess that was most likely made thanks to stuff like food, or would be with catching certain items in a weird way all in a short burst of time, trying to complete it to earn points. This would all go back and forth until the first round would end, with the second starting off with another face-off to see who will take control of the second round, and then we get more trivia questions as all of the point values are now automatically doubled from the previous round. And wherever the points end up by the end of this round dictate who the winning team is, and with that comes their shot at the obstacle course. The points won would equate to dollars, and the total was split between the two contestants, so at least there's an initial cash prize earned after making it through both rounds. Even the team that lost gets to keep and split their earnings, and usually gets some random extra prizes like popular toys and gadgets from the time. For the end of an episode, the obstacle course was the perfect grand finale. It was a multiple part course with flags that represent checkpoints to earn more and more exciting prizes, with the goal of completing all of them to truly become the ultimate winners of the game. With each part of the course, the two players would trade off completing the obstacles, handing off the collected flag to their partner between each one, while having a time limit of one minute to finish the whole course. While all of the toys were pretty cool, even more so for the time in history, when those toys were really popular, the real exciting part was the toy store gift cards and the vacation getaways that made you really want to work for it. And you really had to, I mean, you got messy, you got wet, you have to stick your hand up a giant nose, it was glorious, and I've always wanted to compete on this show. Now, along with Double Dare, there was also episodes of Family Double Dare and Super Sloppy Double Dare, and like I mentioned, Super Sloppy Double Dare was just regular Double Dare, just even messier than before, and Family Double Dare brought the player total to four on each team, two adults, two kids, a nice happy or secretly dysfunctional family ready to play. Once again, it was the same game, it was messy, and I think the kids just like torturing their parents by getting them as dirty as possible. The obstacle 
obstacle course also works the same. Each member of the family rotates between the obstacles, earning prizes along the way. The prizes at least were more family-oriented, and things that parents can enjoy as well. I love Double Dare. It made me feel like I could be on a game show as a kid. And I never was, but at least I was made to feel that I could partake in this messy fun. Or maybe I just wanted the several hundred dollar KB Toys gift card, either or. Another incredible game show, and my personal favorite, honestly, was Figure It Out, hosted by the one and only Summer Sanders. And your boy had the biggest crush on her back in the day. Let me tell you what. But I actually have a full in-depth video about Figure It Out. I'll link down below if you want to check that out after this video. But in general, this show was a lot of fun. Each episode would have two rounds of the game where some kid would be brought onto the show and tell the audience and the viewers at home what their secret special talent is before they appear on set next to Summer as a group of selected stars from Nickelodeon shows would have to guess the blank spaces on the board by asking the kid yes or no questions only while they receive clues about the hidden talent. If they end up guessing the full thing correctly in any of the guessing rounds, the kid would earn any prizes from any of the rounds that they won, but they wouldn't win the grand prize. If the kid's talent manages to stump the panelists, then the kid wins everything. And in the end, the kid would perform their talent for everyone and it could legitimately be something cool and exciting. Or it could just be biting cheese into the shape of a state. I've tested trying this with friends growing up, I've discussed this as a full-grown adult with my friend Ham and Cheddar, and the conclusion we've all come to and have proven is that it really isn't that hard. Is it cool? Yeah, sure. Would anyone say it's a talent? Probably not, but we're not here to pick on a kid, even if that kid is an adult themselves now. The other fun moments would come from trying to play the game along with the panelists, as the show would encourage you to do so by not looking or listening to the start of the episode where the kid reveals the talent. And then there's the secret slime action, which would take place in round two of the guessing, and it would be as simple as one or more of the panelists saying or doing something specific that is told to the audience and viewers in secret from the panelists, and if they end up saying or doing that thing, then they would be slimed and someone in the audience would win a prize. Rinse, repeat, you have a full episode of the show. It was so much fun seeing the stars of Nickelodeon playing the game, hoping for them to get slimed, but for the most part, they would just goof around and not take the game super serious, which made it both lighthearted and a fun thing to watch. Other seasons of the show, like the family style season, a version of the game where the talent is shared between some family members, and the wild style season, a version of the game that put the focus of talents that included animals on display, would also be included in reruns or new premieres as that initial final season, Wild Style, began airing in the fall of 1999. Again, if you want to learn more about the show, the other versions, the reboot, I have a separate video all about that. I just really love Figure It Out, and it's definitely a go-to comfort show for me. Another program that was a bit older was Finders Keepers. It was another game show that was on Nickelodeon back in 1987. Hosted by Wesley Yer, the game here tasked two teams of two kids to find hidden images and pictures to earn an amount of rooms to go and search. The game starts off with some sort of image that has hidden items throughout it, and I use the term hidden lightly as they are fairly obvious, but in how you find them properly, Wesley would give the team some clue in regards to the specific item that they need to locate within the image, with whichever team can buzz in first and circle the correct image, winning $25 and earning one of the first four rooms for that round to go and search. After some back and forth between the teams trying to win as much as they can, the teams are brought over to the house set, being given the room or rooms they will have to play in, as Wesley gives clues, or in some cases, just the answer, to what item they need to specifically find within 30 seconds. If they successfully find that item, they not only win different prizes similar to what contestants on Double Dare could win, but also $50 added to their total bank. If they fail to find the item, the other team earns the money. Usually the cameraman would try to nonchalantly point out to the audience where the item is hiding. You might even catch a glimpse of a hand pointing directly at it coming from behind the camera operator, and somehow the kids don't take note of that. The rooms themselves were always themed in a mix of ordinary setups or special weird and wacky ones, as there may even be some light hazards that try to distract them from their search. Once both teams complete their search, the second round has them heading back for some more picture searching. The value of finding the correct object in the image is now $75, along with getting a new room to search through, with the objects found in the next set of rooms being worth $100, and even including more prizes. But there's a bonus. One of the rooms in the second round may just be the instant prize room, which offers a massive bonus reward prize that they get a chance at claiming if they are able to find the object in addition to the $100 that they will earn. After the second round is complete, both teams get to keep whatever earnings that they won, but the team with the higher amount ends up winning and getting to take part in the room-to-room -room romp. Here the team gets 90 seconds to make their way through six rooms, trying to find 
find the hidden items in each of them as fast as they can, as each item found is another prize that they will win. Collect all six of the items within the given time limit and you would win the grand prize. And become legends as you celebrate with your teammate over the total earnings. It really plays to this rambunctious fantasy of just tearing up and completely destroying a house, which should sound pretty fun on its own since it's not a real house, but mix that in with money, toys, and other incentives, I mean, come on, that sounds incredible. It's a cool idea, perfectly suited for kids to play, and I feel that I would have had the time of my life participating in it. I would have peaked in my life right then and there. Now, let's switch gears to one of the channel's other types of programming with Nickelodeon Sports Theater with Shaquille O'Neal. To be fair, this originally was a Nickelodeon segment starting back in 1996. There were a total of five different specials made here, with the first two premiering before Nickelodeon Gas even existed, and then the final three after were all perfect to be shown on Nickelodeon Gas. This was mainly a way for Shaq to have a vessel that was directed at kids to inspire, uplift, and motivate them to accomplish their goals. Having a focus on telling stories that relate personally to him and can resonate with so many out there. Aside from Shaq being in it, this special miniseries is probably most remembered for its premiere episode which serves as a shorter TV movie called Four Points, which showcased a roughly five-foot high school freshman being bullied and led astray from following his passion and dreams of playing on the school basketball team, despite his height. The film itself is pretty good, there are some cameos in it as well, and Shaq does a good job at adding in pivotal, narrative-driven moments to allow for introspection and pushing through everything that can hold you back from following your dreams or finding the confidence to stand up for yourself. You know, the feel-good kind of stuff. That was the vibe of the series, and it was a perfect fit for the Gas Channel at the end of the day. Another show we already mentioned, so I'll be brief about it here, is Renford Rejects. The show followed these aspiring football, once again for the Americans, soccer, players, who formed their own team called the Renford Rovers, submitting themselves to become an officially recognized team for the league that they would play in. Their name on the entry form gets tampered with, thanks to another rival player officially making their name the Renford Rejects. The group of, well, rejects, I guess, end up embracing the accidental new name that was submitted for them, building up their confidence that they desperately need to have a strong will to face the competition going forward. The show actually lasted for several seasons, and it wasn't half bad either. Okay, let's talk about the show that really inspired me making this whole video in the first place, and that's Nickelodeon Guts. I love Guts, I think it was such a cool show, and I've always wanted to own an official piece of the aggro crag. Not one of the replica remakes of it, an official winning piece. So, thanks for watching this video while I hope to eventually earn one myself. Yes, by that I mean just buy one of the official pieces that are floating out there. See mom, I am responsible with money. Guts was one of the coolest shows around. It had already completely aired on Nickelodeon between 1992 and 1995, but who doesn't love a good rerun, huh? You had three different competitors for the game on either the red, purple, or blue team as they went through different rounds of sports-based challenges that were turned up to the max. Each round they would face off in different events that could strap them into a bungee harness or have them in some sort of water-based setup with other core setups beyond those mixed in throughout the series. It could be some basketball-related challenges, it could be soccer-related challenges, it could literally be anything as long as it relates to a sport, no matter if it was on the more standard side of options or the more extreme side of sports options. Whatever the challenge would be, the twist of how to play it or what the objective would be would add in the entertainment value and for the competitors, the fun factor of the competition in general. In between the different rounds, we would get to have a moment with the individual competitors, as they would add in some personal anecdotes in these interview-style moments called Spill Your Guts. The show was hosted by Mike O'Malley and Moira Quirk, as they helped keep the energy flowing high and add in commentary over the different rounds. Once the rounds were completed, there was one final challenge left. Yep, you guessed it, the aggro crag, this giant crystal-like mountain where each competitor has to make their way up the mountain while hitting and activating all of their light beams, finishing at the top of the aggro crag to hit the final light. Now, you don't just win for doing this. Based on all the other points won throughout the challenges really settles the difference of who could win. The previous rounds offer 300 points to whoever took first place in each round, 200 to second place, and 100 to last place. However, the aggro crag offers first place 725 points, second place 550 points, and last place with 375 points. But to complete the aggro crag, you must turn on every beacon of light before reaching the top for the final one. If you miss any, the crag troll will would stop you from progressing until you go back and activate them. But it's even more challenging than that, as this rigid and rough climb is full of many hazards being sent towards the competitors, from the lighting effects, snow, crystals being chucked around, and even falling rocks. On top of this, there were rules to follow as well. Mainly, you just couldn't interfere with the other climbers, you stayed
stay in your own lane and only activate your own light. If you managed to fully win the game overall, you would win the first place gold medal, while the others would win medals at either second or third place. But more importantly for first place, you'd win a special glowing piece of the aggro crag. Seriously, if you were on the show and you won and you still have in your possession the piece of the aggro crag, hit me up. Maybe we can work out uh, some sort of deal. Am I being serious about this? <laughs> Guess we'll have to wait and find out. Later on in the series run, the aggro crag was replaced by a slight redesign of the mountain called the mega crag, which is still pretty cool, but to me, less iconic. The show was such a blast to watch, and there were even some specials like Guts All-Stars, but there was another version of the show that the gas channel would air, and that was Global Guts. And Global Guts serves as the technical last season of the competitive show, and along with it, another update to the mountain they would climb, now being called the Super Aggro Crag. See, now we're talking. The main difference with this version of the show was that it featured competitors from all around the world who we get to meet, learn a bit about them and where they're from, as this became a way to syndicate the show to more markets around the globe, you know, hence the name, with other regional hosts commentating the events of the game for their respective regions. Pretty much everything was the same though, just a bit more nationality pride during the award ceremonies at the end, and it's a great time to be had for all. They even made a Super Nintendo video game based on the show. It's nostalgic to me, but I wouldn't say it was overall the best game in the world. I'd much rather play in the actual show than play the game if you catch my drift. Nick Gas. Your games, your sports. Now, this next one is another highly well-known show that many people may even claim as their favorite, and that's Legends of the Hidden Temple. I mean, do I even need to elaborate? Well, yeah, I still will, but I feel like we all know what's going on here. Hosted by Kirk Fogg, this competitive game show wanted to bring the thrilling action of adventure right to your very oversized television sets of the 90s. Much like Guts, the whole series started and ended before the Gas Channel was around, airing between 1993 and 1995. The show was split up into four rounds with six teams starting off facing each other. The teams were the Red Jaguars, the Green Monkeys, the Purple Parrots, the Blue Barracudas, the Silver Snakes, and of course, the people champ, the Orange Iguanas, as they each consisted of two contestants, one boy and one girl. The first round was known as the Moat, as each team would try and cross this body of water by swinging, climbing, and swimming their way to the other side of it to then go and hit a gong, representing that your team, both of you, made it across and were one of the first four teams to do so, as the two teams that didn't make it, in time, get eliminated from the game. The teams that pass get to enter into the second round, where they would be greeted by Olmec, this giant stone head voiced by D. Baker, who also serves as the announcer on the show. Olmec welcomes the remaining teams to the Steps of Knowledge, where he would go into the specific artifact that resides within the temple, setting up more of the themes for the rest of the episode. He would also clue the players in to where within the temple this artifact could be found, and begins grilling them on their memory, giving out questions as the teams could buzz in to answer by stepping on the button and giving it a shot. If you got the question right, your team advances down the steps. Get three questions right, and your team makes it to the next round. If you fail at knowing the answer, the other teams get a chance to answer it as well. Once two teams have made their way down all the steps from getting the answers correct, the round ends with the two teams that didn't make it getting eliminated. The final two teams now head into the third round known as the Temple Games. Here they are put to the test to prepare themselves for what comes after, as they have to partake in some physical challenges in order to win pendants that represent their life points in the final event. The challenges themselves could be several different things based on the episode's specific theme, but the structure here has the first and second challenge be one on one face-offs between a member of each team, with the prize for beating the other team in the challenges being half a piece of the pendant, hoping that your team could win both halves from the first two challenges to equal one full pendant. The final challenge would have both members of each team competing again as the winner here would receive a full whole pendant, with the overall winner at the end being the team with the most pendants and or pendant pieces, crowning your team as the champions of the main game itself, but granting you entrance into the final round, the Temple Run. This is where the real fun happens, as the two members of the winning team decide who makes the first initial run through the temple, taking in one full pendant piece for protection, as while they're navigating through the temple trying to solve puzzles, unlock doors, and hopefully avoid the various temple guards randomly hidden throughout the 12-room, 2.5-floor temple, and make it to the exact room where the artifact is hidden to snatch it. If one of the guards catches you, you lose a full pendant, but can still play. But if you're caught without it, you were taken by the guard, and that first run, however far they got, was 
was ended, leaving the second team member to finish the mission. Luckily, anything that the first player did, like puzzle solve, doors open, and pathways unlock, will be that way for that second player now, along with any triggered temple guards no longer occupying the rooms that they were once in. Now, if you only had half a pendant left for this second run, the other half could now be found within the temple randomly placed so that the other player stands a better chance of surviving the guards if they appear. There's really only two options left for the second player, complete the journey to the artifact or get captured and lose the chance to win the grand prize. For even just reaching the temple itself, there was a prize given to the team since they technically won the main part of the game, and then if you got a hold of the artifact, you won another prize, but in general, there was a three minute time limit to complete the task of not only getting the artifact, but successfully escaping from the temple with it to earn the grand prize. The only challenge after grabbing the artifact is making it out of there before the time is out, since the temple guards all disappear when you get a hold of the artifact and begin your dash out of there. Legends of the Hidden Temple truly delivers on an exciting competitive game show, offering an array of distinctly different rounds leading up to a heart-pounding finale, where if you saw the team members get grabbed by the guards, it crushes your soul to see them defeated. This is the one game show that I feel would offer the most amount of challenge thanks to the variety of the challenges themselves throughout, and the threat of what stands in your way of completing the temple run. Regardless, it was a fun show to watch, it even has a continued legacy in the vein of a Nickelodeon TV movie, as well as a one-season revival on the CW that has adults, presumably ones who watched the original show growing up, getting to live the childhood fantasy of being a contestant on the show. The next one is a pretty fun and memorable one as well. Let's take a look at Nick Arcade. This show only ran for a couple seasons in the early 90s, but it's a true classic for a couple reasons. It was about video games, and it was hosted by Phil Moore. There seemed to be this division between the youth where you either liked being active and were outdoors playing sports, or you preferred being inside and playing video games only, and personally, I never saw it as that, and thankfully, the Nickelodeon Gas Channel didn't either. I think for the most part, playing video games is a universal enjoyment, even if you're more casual with it or more hardcore with it, depending on how you focus and how much time you put into that medium. And today, it's easy to see that, but growing up during the 90s and the early 2000s, there definitely felt like there was some manufactured separation. Nick Arcade being shown on the Games and Sports channel feels perfectly fine to me, with it being a game show specifically focused on gaming. The game starts off with a member from each team facing off in the face-off, playing a segment of a selection of video games with the winning team earning 25 points and getting to start off the first round of trivia. The trivia was presented through this semi-mascot of the show, Mikey, the video adventurer, who would be brought up on screen and be on the themed game board as he would be given directions to move, just not diagonally. The goal was to make it to the goal, pretty straightforward. The teams would take turns picking which direction Mikey heads in, and the tile that is landed on presents itself as either some points added to your score, puzzles to then solve, pop quizzes to answer, bonus prizes to win, as well as some other fun stuff thrown in there, and you can even encounter an enemy, which instantly turns the control of Mikey over to the other team. You want to be the team who gets to move Mikey to the goal space at the end of the board to earn the goal points if you can answer the goal question correctly. If neither team can actually get to the goal space by the end of the time allotted for the round, Mikey would automatically activate the goal space for a trivia match for the teams to buzz in first and answer correctly to win the goal points. There was another type of space that you can land on that was probably the most exciting, and that was the video challenge. That team would then have one of them play the selected game and try to beat a certain high score within an area of the game and given a time limit, while the other team member would pick a number of points from what they've earned to wager on the teammate meeting or even beating the high score. If the player manages to do so, they get the amount of points wagered added to their score, and continue playing as Mikey. If not, they lose the points and control of Mikey. The second round was more of the same thing, just with the points overall being worth more, and whoever is leading in points by the end of that second round wins the game in general. But just like the other game shows, there is still some fun left to be had. The losing team still takes away some extra prize goodies, but the winning team gets to enter the video zone. Here the kids would literally be put into the video game themselves. Kind of. The kids would go into a special blue screen area to be chroma keyed into what we see as the audience, where they have a time limit to make their way through the different levels and complete their objectives to then reach the boss fight. They have to jump and duck to collect certain items and avoid enemies to pass each stage and with this, having to climb over keyed out items like ladders or stairs to navigate certain obstacles. Honestly, this looked really good at the time, and even in some cases, the integration of the ladders and stairs matches up really well to how they would be matched
matched up within the game itself for how it looks to the audience. Each level pass would grant the players some prizes, along with collecting the objects given each level would net them with a cash prize for each item, and defeating the boss at the end would offer the biggest prize overall. I think the world needs more video game game shows in the world because this show just oozes 90s energy, and it looks like a heck of a lot of fun. I have countless memories watching Nick Arcade and it was cool to see it be a part of the games and sports channel, and my gosh, what I wouldn't give to have been a part of this show. Let's visit Mike O'Malley again as he hosted another thing in the early 90s called Get the Picture. At this point, when talking about all these game shows so close to each other, they really all fit a familiar mold in how they're structured. The only real thing that changes are the challenges and the theme of the whole show itself. Two teams of two kids each get asked trivia questions, and if you get the answer correct, you win 20 bucks, and you get to pick a square from the video board. The video board itself is divided into a bunch of squares with a dotted outline of an image that you're trying to uncover. After you get a correct answer, you can choose which square you'd like revealed, and you can try and take a guess at what that image is, earning $50 if you actually guess it right, but you'd lose 20 if you got it wrong. You could also choose to not guess at all and hold on to the points that you've earned from the question. If the round runs out of time before either team guesses it, the image would start to reveal itself slowly as the teams would try and guess it first with no money lost for multiple guesses or wrong answers. Just who can get it first? Whoever does still gets 50 bucks. This show specifically offered the most awkward moments of silence and questions just not getting answered, as the questions themselves were just generic random trivia. They could be about anything, and it was pretty funny to see Mike try and navigate the silence from the kids. As a random bit of fun to the game, sometimes one of the squares picked would be a power surge square, giving the team the chance at some more money with a quick game, like trying to guess an image quickly while it's being revealed. The second round played out slightly different. Instead of a dotted line, all the boxes now had numbers at the end of their connecting points, as every right question answered allowed the team to connect a line between the numbers to hopefully create the outline of the boxes to show a part of the image. Each question now had multiple answers to give to them. The amount of answers given to a singular question gave you that many lines to connect. You could also earn $40 per question answered correctly, and guessing the picture correctly would win you $75 instead of $50. And any power surges that were found this round were done as physical challenges. The team with more money, or points, same thing, kind of, this was changed to just points later on in the show's life, would win the whole game by the end of the second round, giving them a chance to play the special mega memory game, where nine images would be shown on the screen in front of them within the different squares, having 10 seconds for them to look at the corresponding numbers the images were at as well. After this, when a clue to the picture is given, they have to click the number that was associated with the picture being described using this comically large number pad within 45 seconds. Getting six of the nine correct would net them $600 in total to split, while beyond that would win them the grand prizes that the announcer teases before they play. This by no means was the biggest or most popular game show, but rewatching episodes now will fill you with enough awkward moments for a lifetime, and for that, we love it. A smaller show that happened at the start of the 90s that was also perfect for the Gas Channel was Skate TV. While it didn't last long, the show took advantage of the rising popularity of skateboarding and delivered a show all about the extreme sport, as it was powered by actual skateboarders with the show's conception coming from the SoCal skateboarding legends, Z-Boys. You'd get some fun interviews, skate montages, and much more, but the big exciting selling point was getting to see the professionals at work, from lesser known amateurs in the sport to top dogs like Tony Hawk. On top of all this, the show was hosted by Skate Master Tate and a young Matthew Lillard. It was a really fun time to be had. If you were into skateboarding, this show really was for you, as you even get informational segments about different types of boards and any sort of general knowledge that you need if you already have or are wanting to get into skateboarding. Really, anything that helps you get better acquainted with or more into the sport and hobby as a whole. The next game show had an interesting little resurgence. Wild and Crazy Kids was a show that originally ran in the early 90s, with the reruns heading to Nickelodeon Gas at launch, but the show itself came back in 2002 with new episodes for a single season. The show was hosted by a few teenagers as they would put other kid contestants through random challenges that took whatever the mundane based concept was and added some weird and crazy twists to them. This felt so homegrown thanks to the show having the competitions outside at parks, sidewalks, swimming pools, just random places you'd see in a standard neighborhood. Sometimes the show would take you to more places like a beach or even have theme park related special episodes to spice up the games being played. Another reason the show felt so homegrown was thanks to the players and even the winners, 
winning nothing. Nothing but bragging rights, that is. The show did have fun with what they produced, the kids got to partake in some cool activities, and they even raised some money for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in an episode. It was a lighthearted and good-spirited time, and celebrities even made some cameos in episodes as well, with Tobey Maguire even swinging by, nearly a decade before he was even Spider-Man. Hi, I'm Luis Gonzalez of the Arizona Diamondbacks. You're watching Nickelodeon Gas. Hi, this is Mike Stan with the New York Mets. You're watching Nick Gaff. Now, don't confuse this next show with the other show of the same name starring John Quinones. And that's What Would You Do? Mark Summers is back to host this early 90s series, and the base concept is seeing how things are handled in manufactured random settings, as we would see some recorded bit of footage where the kids, or even their families involved, are in some sort of weird circumstance that leaves out what happens in the end of the situation, leaving the audience to guess what actually happens. Or like the name of the show suggests, what would they do? Do. Pies were very important to the show, and I'm not talking about the pies that Hugh Neutron loves, but the classic ones that would often land in people's faces. This show always had some sort of special pie setup that would be used as a form of punishment if the randomly selected audience member isn't able to perform whatever random task Mark gives them. Often though, the kids seemed pretty eager to hop right into whatever the pie device is and wanted to get pied. From the classic pie pod, to the pie slide, to the pie wash, to the pie pendulum, and even way more than that, there was always the threat of pie being distributed to someone's face at any given moment. Other segments of the show also all led back to the pie machines at the end of the day, with stuff like the Anything That You Can Do segment having selected audience members face off in a head-to-head -head competition of some sorts, usually being a kid going up against one of their parents. For more, there was the What Would You Do Melody Edition, as contestants would have cards on their heads with a random challenge on them that they could eventually choose to attempt or take a pie to the face. And these usually had to do with food items and just getting messy in general. And this was eventually replaced later on in the show's life with Wallow Stuff, which had a random audience member get picked based on a number they would be given and the device randomly picking. This participant would get to open one of the 20 door options presented to them, hoping that on the other side is something good. There was a mix of prizes that could be won, but more often than not, there was something pie related behind them, like a whole lot of pie ready to hit you in the face, or getting sent to be pied in a pie machine. And that's really just kind of scratching the surface. The show overall was alright, and it got to have a little spotlight on the Nickelodeon Gas channel many years after it ended. The next game show actually ended just months before the Gas Channel started up and didn't have a major amount of episodes, but still had the reruns play over on the new channel. And that's You're On, and hey look, it's hosted by Phil Moore. It was all about kids going out and trying to complete a series of tasks with random people they find, having to convince them to do whatever weird, wacky, or silly thing that they were tasked with within 10 minutes. This would go on for a few rounds, but there were other parts of the show to keep it feeling fresh, with the runaround moments that took six studio members the first time they do this, and three members for the second time they do it, who get to guess if the contestants complete their given tasks or not, winning them a prize if their guess turns out correct. The end of the episodes consisted of a messy finale, as an adult from one of the runaround segments would have their kid put them in a situation to mess them up, and that's what they get for losing. You're On is one of the more forgotten about game shows from Nickelodeon, it came at the tail end of the game show era, and it didn't get a chance to get more attention because of that. Luckily, Nickelodeon Gas gave it a little spotlight, but again, there were so many game shows on this channel now, and a lot of them just kind of blended together. When it came to more sports-related programming, a new show that started right before the Gas Channel would start up, coming out on Nickelodeon at first, then also going to the new channel, was Sports Illustrated for Kids. Not to be confused with the magazine, I mean, there was still the magazine, which was a spinoff of the regular Sports Illustrated magazine, but this was a special short-lived series that focused on getting up close with the athletes from many different sports. From basketball with Grant Hill, to tennis with Venus and Serena Williams. From baseball, to snowboarding, to football, to wakeboarding, it wanted to show these larger-than-life athletes in a more personal light, seeing how much work they put into their craft and what it takes to be on their levels. It's your typical feel-good sports docu-series that drives home the determination and focus it takes, as well as inspires you to put your all into what you love. Think Fast was originally a late 80s, early 90s game show that was brought over to Nickelodeon Gas with Michael Carrington hosting the first season and Skip Lackey filling in to host the second. The name Think Fast refers to the contestants having to think fast when playing through the game, which had two teams of two playing through different games that could be like Simon Says, figuring out quickly what a word spelled backwards actually is, balancing weight on a seesaw, and the list goes on. No, seriously, there are so many different 
different types of events, with some even having slight variations within the event in general. It would take a whole video in equal length to this one to run through them all. And I think that's pretty cool, honestly. It always would make the episodes feel fresh, offering many new things for the participants to do. There were two rounds, like usual, with all the events that they've played having a value of $50 for the first round and $100 for the second. And in between the events themselves, there would be an image hidden by puzzle pieces with the winning team getting a chance to see a piece of the puzzle removed and take a guess at the image. This was called the Brain Bender, and if you were able to solve it, it was worth 200 bucks, and it could last the entirety of both rounds to solve, but sometimes it would be solved before the second round even started, giving the players another Brain Bender to try and guess throughout the second round. In the end, there was of course a bonus stage for the overall winner of the game from having the most money earned from winning the events or guessing the Brain Benders, and that was the Locker Room. Here, there were a bunch of lockers that contained matching people or things that the contestants had to match. With 15 lockers presented, there were seven matches to make in total, with one remaining locker left for a time bomb in the first season that needed to be deactivated within the first 20 seconds of the person opening the lockers, and a red herring in the second season that the audience and the viewers at home are aware of that doesn't have a match, and the players have to call it out and pull a certain lever if they think that that's the red herring. All done in one minute, the team is shown something or someone to match, as they have to run through the set, opening up the lockers to find the match, and then reshut them after they find it. To get to the base cash prize, it would require four matches that needed to be made, with each match after, earning them the big reward prizes. But it wasn't just that simple. Most times when the lockers are opened, they would present some sort of hazard with stuff like silly string being shot out at them to affect their speed and how coherent they are. Sometimes the kids would run through here and do pretty well. Sometimes the kids wouldn't stand a chance to make it all the way through, even when they took turns between each locker openings in the second season, instead of getting 30 seconds fully each like in the first. Think Fast was definitely a lot of fun, it felt quick, and you got to see a large variety of events taking place for the rounds, mixed in there with a bit of get the picture. Aside from all of that for the channel's premiere in 1999, Nickelodeon had some reruns of their regular programming join the network to essentially fill in certain time schedules with stuff like Keenan and Kel, Cousin Skeeter, and Salute Your Shorts, which rather than breaking down shows like that within this video, they're probably better suited for their own video, as that would be a lot to add on this one, plus they were never really the point of that channel anyway. Think of them as good filler between what the channel was actually really focused on. After 1999, more shows would join the network, but definitely not to the same extent as what 1999 offered. In the great year of 2000, the Nickelodeon Gas Channel first added on another game show that ran at the end of the 80s and the start of the 90s called Make the Grade. Originally, the first two seasons of the show were recorded with Lou Schneider as the host, and also not in front of a live studio audience. In fact, it was a fake audience track that played to pretend like there was one. But then the show moved locations for its third season, this time with a studio audience along with a new host, Rob Edward Morris. The show had a central color theme of red, green, and blue, from the logo to the set. And there would be three desks, one of each color, with one contestant sitting at each. As the name of the show hints at, it's related to educational grade levels as the players answer questions pertaining to different school classes. There would be a board that had seven random categories that would change out each time between history, music, science, home ec, geography, PE, mathematics, English, arts, social studies, current events, and even special electives, which could be anything. And across the top, there were seven grade levels that ran all the way up to 12th grade. The higher the grade level category question, the tougher they would be. It makes sense. Each player had their own board to represent how they're doing in the game, as the goal was to earn the different tiles to reach a total of owning 14 of them by the end of two rounds, or just having the most by the end. Doing so won you $500 and access to the honors round. The 14 tiles, though, needed to be one specifically by acquiring a correct answer in each subject and one question from each grade level. If you get the question wrong, the others get a chance to answer if they think they know it. If no one gets the answer right, that tile was lost for the rest of the round. It would go dark and couldn't be collected later. That would change in the second and third season where the tiles would stay in play just with a new question when it comes back around. It also isn't just as straightforward as that. There were a few ways they made the game spicier as some tiles would include four other possible game changers, like the take option allowing whoever got it to take another contestant's tile that they get to choose. Another similar one would be hitting a tile with the lose option, making you give up a tile that you get to choose, but it goes back on the board and is given a new question attached to it so it can be won again. Free option can be found, just giving you the tile without answering the question, but the most exciting would be the fire drill option, which put the players into a physical challenge. Whatever the challenge may be, messy or not, whoever completes it first gets to choose which desk they now want to sit at, which could easily be the biggest come up or the worst downfall depending on how you've done in the game so far and or how you play the challenge. 
Second place gets to choose from the last two deaths, with third place just getting what's left. In the end, the two players who didn't win still get some prizes and 50 bucks, while the winner got that $500 and a shot at an additional $1,000 from the Honors Round, or a trip to Universal Studios Florida in the second and third seasons. The Honors Round was taking three categories from the main game itself and offering seven questions in total, all having to be answered in 45 seconds. The first six questions would be worth $100, but that seventh question, meaning they've completed them all, jumps the winnings up to $1,000, or like I've just said for the later seasons, the trip to Universal Studios, but still getting $100 to $600 from the first six questions. Sometimes during the second season, there would be a bonus university round that had the winner answer five even harder questions that each were worth money, starting at $50 for the first and $1,000 for the fifth. The player could pull out if they didn't think that they could answer the questions further, netting them any extra money won from the questions. I honestly really enjoyed this game show and watching reruns of it on Nickelodeon and gas introduced me to it, so I think that's pretty cool. As a bonus, some episodes featured an extra segment, if there was still time to fill, that would feature Lou going around in public and asking questions to random people for a chance to win some prizes or merch. In the third season, this transferred to just using the studio audience getting a chance to be selected to play and win, since they finally had one. Overall, really fun show, it easily blends into the other ones because of the structure, but I think it deserves a bit more love, or at least have given it some sort of revival on the gas channel, but that's just me. Another show that was brought to the channel was Nick News with Linda Ellerby, a program that started its run on Nickelodeon in 1992 and went on to play for a few years simultaneously on their other Nickelodeon sister channel, Noggin, in 1999. In 2000, it would also be brought to gas for a bit with it mainly focusing on special airings of the show to take time in the schedule to broadcast it. The show itself lasted all the way until 2015 with Linda Ellerby, and in 2020 it came back with specials and interstitials between shows on Nickelodeon, just minus Linda. Linda Ellerby, though, wears a lot of titles from her work in being a news correspondent, a journalist, an anchor, among much more. There isn't really a lot to say about the show in relation to the Nickelodeon Gas Channel as the program was more widely known from the other stations it can be viewed on, and it was a limited showing on the Gas Channel anyway. It was news presented to kids, keeping them informed on the happenings of the world and allowing a younger generation to be a part of the conversation, since they are the future generations, or for how long it ran, generations, that will have to deal with the world left for them when they become adults. It is iconic because because most people who grew up with the program, specifically in the 90s I'd say, know the name Linda Ellerby by heart, and so it goes. As the Nickelodeon gas channel lived on, nothing really would be added to the rotation of shows until 2002, where Double Dare 2000 finally joined on. This version of the show only lasted for less than a year when it went into production and released their episodes, truly earning the 2000 in their title as it was only a new thing that year. After just being on Nickelodeon, it came out on Nickelodeon gas for the reruns, as it was just more of Double Dare, playing up the 2000s turn of the millennium vibes, bigger production value, and even a new host, having Jason Harris step in the role of Mark Summers. The only real new addition added to the show that we hadn't seen before, aside from the set looking new and the challenges being updated and messier, was the addition of a Triple Dare option that takes place during the second round of the game, making the value of completing the physical challenge $300, as well as earning some other prizes. It was a fun revamp of the show, it brought the fun of the game to the start of the 2000s, and even if it didn't last longer than a year, this version of the show is highly remembered next to the main show itself, and for me, it's the second version I think of right after remembering Double Dare. But what version of Double Dare was your favorite? This next one, there is little to no footage online surrounding it, but it had to do with another popular show that didn't even get broadcast to the gas channel yet, Maximum Rocket Power Games. It was a thing adjacent to the Rocket Power cartoon as the theme was based on the cartoon. It had three teams with four kids and two sports athletes compete in a few extreme sporting events. The teams would be themed after the kids from the show, with Team Otto, Team Reggie, and Team Twister, but no Team Squid. This seemed to have been a one-off thing for the specific showing of it, and the teams here duked it out over three rounds, starting off with a recreation of the Zorb to Mountain Bike Relay Race in the Rocket Power TV movie special, with the second round being a three-man tube to snowboarding race, finishing off with a skate park relay, where Team Twister won the whole thing. Regardless of what it fully was, it clearly made sense to be on the gas channel, channel or so we thought, but it was odd to be on there without the main show itself broadcasting alongside it regardless. But nevertheless, this was also a way to help sell a live event, turning this into Maximum Rocket Power Live, the battle for Madtown Park, a live show that would be toured around the state showing cool stunts and competitions with some extreme sports all done by performers along with mascot outfits of the characters in the show. This didn't end up doing well in ticket sales, again, not much is known out there when it comes to what this fully entailed, but it looks like the planned 40-stop tour 
ended after about a month of touring, not hitting a major portion of the planned tour dates. The most information we have about it comes from this random blog page that details some stuff that a person named Sarah Jane is doing, where she apparently was the stage manager for the show itself, and she included that SpongeBob SquarePants makes some sort of cameo in the performance. This was found thanks to Huff and Puff 420 on the Lost Media Wiki forms, as the trail for knowing more kind of ends there. Where we can find some more details and information is this old press release from Nickelodeon, advertising this special that featured the premiere of the TV movie for Rocket Power called Race Across New Zealand, with a special live action game segment called the Rocket Power Gas Games that would premiere right after. And it seems to be the same thing as Maximum Rocket Power Games. I mean, it has the gas branding in the title, among several other things tying it back to gas. The event is described in the same vein, consisting of players recreating moments from the movie, with it still being a competition in the end. It also appears because of this that it first was on the main Nickelodeon channel before being shown on the Gas channel, but at least it is a good advertisement of it. The press release also announces the live version that would be toured more if it didn't wipe out in ticket sales. The later naming of Maximum Rocket Power seems to be coming from a special issue of Nickelodeon magazine that started promoting the celebration of Rocket Power through the medium. And regardless if it was originally premiered as the Rocket Power Gas Games, with it eventually changing to the Maximum Rocket Power Games, as anything that we really have out there is this one image logo that says that name, and the end credits of it, which also features that name. And while I appreciate that the end credits exist online, and I appreciate the channel Nick Archiver 52 for posting it, where's the full thing? If you have the credits, or someone out there has the credits, where's the full event? As for anything else, Skateboard.com also offers a bit of insight to the event more accessible than the other bits of detail found. But it's a lot of the same thing reiterated. For more games and sports action, keep it right here on Nick Gas. What do you get when you blend together a bunch of the iconic game shows along with iconic hosts? You get the three episode special Nickelodeon All-Star Challenge. Six teams comprised of one celebrity to serve as the team captain, one winner from Guts, and one winner from Legends of the Hidden Temple, and the main hosts of the show or judges were Mike O'Malley, Phil Moore, Robin Morella, and even Olmec is there too. It was a star-studded event and it was a really special time. Originally premiering in October of 1994, this three-part special event would pit the teams against Against each other in three rounds full of plenty to get excited for. Round one was a representation of each game show the host represented, with Guts having a slam dunk contest, a game of dodgeball, and a slam a jamma where players would go up against each other trying to score baskets with the other person on a different team trying to block them. And all of these were done in Guts fashion, having some sort of other challenging element to use or deal with while competing, most times like bungees. For the Legends of the Hidden Temple set of challenges, it would have them shooting at targets with slingshots, spinning wheels with their body weight, and then being locked into this seesaw-like device that would spin around as the players go up and down trying to grab items from a higher ledge and drop them into a basket. For What Would You Do, there was the Mermaid Splash, having the celebrity dolled up like a mermaid as they launch fish from a tiny pool for their team to catch. There was Human Bowling, which is self-explanatory enough, and Sumo Wrestling, wearing those fun big suits. And for the Double Dare representation, there was some toilet plunger launching, trying to get them stuck on a plexiglass barrier as the winning team gets their teammates behind the glass slimed after getting three of the plungers stuck. There was pie in your pants where they would launch pies at their teammates who have these big clown pants on trying to catch more pies in them than the other teams, and rubber baby bungee jumpers as they would get strapped into a bungee that represents a diaper as they then bounce up and down to land on balloons rolled down to them, having the milk that was inside fill up a bucket. Round two would focus on trivia, being called the Gakfest question round, where a member from one team reads the other teams a question. The others buzz in and if someone gets it right, the other person is slimed. Wrong answers equal slime, and the person who gets it right gets control of asking the next question. All of the challenges we went through were spread out between the three parts, as the episode was structured by having a rapid succession of four quick games played, one from each represented show, as they would move on to the trivia for the second round and finishing things off in the third round with an outdoor challenge to end it, declaring a winner from the three teams in the first two parts. The final challenge for part one was a big game of volleyball split into three ways 
ways. For the second part, the other three teams played a Gak Gauntlet, which had the players taking turns running through a line of the other teams throwing Gak-filled balloons at them, trying to make it across without getting gacked. After these first two parts, the team that won the first part and the team that won the second part were guaranteed to move on for part three, participating in the final round of events. A third team was selected as the wildcard team, essentially being the third place team from the points they've been playing for to determine who is in the lead. As we get to the end of part three, one of the three teams gets eliminated after the second round, with the final round and challenge having the final two teams wear helmets as they try and pop gack-filled balloons sent flying their way, with that final event determining the winner of the whole shebang, which turned out to be the red team with the purple and pink teams as runner-ups. This was the best of all worlds coming together for this awesome event. The hosts had fun, the games and challenges were cool, and it was all executed really well, being super engaging throughout the whole thing. For all the final round events, the teams could use the points that they've earned and trade a hundred of them for every random crowd member that was out there watching that they could get to join their team to help them win. So they were always fun to watch by the end of each part. It was cool to have this rerun on the gas channel for those who never got to experience it initially, aka me. I just think it was a really awesome event, and I really wish they did more of it. Now, to cool off from all this excitement, let's head over to Splash TV, a smaller show that focused on all the fun and cool stuff that you can do in different bodies of water in different locations, showing off stuff from sports that can be played or what activities you can partake in. While there are only 15 episodes to the series, they were split up between three seasons, releasing five each summer from 2002 to 2004. This was an original series, not another re-ran show from the past, but only the third season would be exclusive to Nickelodeon Gas, as seasons one and two would feature on Nickelodeon as well. Splash serves as the first Nickelodeon Gas original series produced, but it was on Nickelodeon thanks to Nickelodeon having a special programming block on their main channel that would house gas-related shows for a couple hours before regular programming would play, or other blocks would start like Teen Nick or Nick at Night. USA Swimming, the overseer of the athletes on the national team, would lend professional Olympic swimmers to join episodes of the show to help show off the vast amount of things that you can do in the water. So, you know, that's pretty neat. And all right, the year is now 2003, and the acceptance of gaming is going more mainstream than ever before. So Nickelodeon Gas wasn't afraid to embrace it. It's a bit cringy in presentation, but that's part of what makes it special. Welcome to Game Farm. Hosted by the overly excited duo of Ann and Max, the show was another original piece of programming for the network. This show was like all of what early G4 was before reruns of Cops and Cheaters took over that network, giving you gaming, gaming news, skits, and more. Starting the show, the players would be strapped into these special gaming setups as the three of them would face off against each other, as well as a random four player via online technology. How 2003 of them. While the players play through their two rounds, we get cutaways to preludes of other stuff to come throughout the episode, as well as stuff like the top five segment, giving viewers a chance to vote in these top fives on nick.com slash gas. And I think we know this kid's top five crushes and all of them are Anne. Dude is locked in right now. We would also visit the Game Farm Lab, where the hosts would break down some sort of technology in gaming, like how and why controllers have force feedback, explaining the Rumble feature that was becoming more of a standard for controllers. There was Gamertainment Tonight, which was a spoof of SNL's Weekend Update, giving some fake news but adding a bunch of decently written references and some not bad jokes poking fun at real and fake things about video games, as well as video game characters and even the publishers and studios behind them. It's a quick segment, but genuinely a decent little skit. They also have a live action human video game bit where the person playing would be doing some sort of physical challenge that relates back to the video game it's trying trying to bring to life. At the end of the gaming rounds that happen in the background, the winner of it all gets to face the Gaminator, this mysterious pro gamer that poses the biggest competition and threat to the champion of the two rounds. If the challenger beats the Gaminator, that's it. High fives and celebration all around? Unless you're the winner, who was the online player from a remote location, then you just get to cheer in your bedroom alone before the credits roll. And it literally feels like a show from the time period it came out in, it's just hard to explain, but it's really just a feeling that comes from viewing it. And you should, with what limited episodes are out there able to be watched. I mean, the fact that there is a random dude skateboarding on a small half pipe in the background the whole time should be enough to sell you on why this show was rad or cheesy, but both options work and they're both awesome. They also had Junie from Spy Kids in an episode, and that says everything you need to know. Most of the series is unfortunately lost today, but hopefully the full series can be brought forth to the internet soon enough. Another big obsession of the time was two robots being built and made to do battle, a harmless way to watch things fight each other that doesn't hurt humans or animals. But when the robot uprising eventually happens, this is a core memory
memory that they will have and they aren't going to be happy about it. Nickelodeon Robot Wars officially premiered on the main Nickelodeon channel and only lasted for a handful of episodes, with all of them premiering as reruns on the Gas channel in 2003. It was just robots built to fight one another, being Nickelodeon's version of Robot Wars, a longer running series that was on in the UK. Nickelodeon gets the rights to make their own version, except having a focus on the US builders and battlers going to the UK to face the British in Metal Combat, and if you like watching that and seeing the builders and battlers behind it all, then hey, here's more robot fighting for you. And also, here's this kid's iconic bull to mullet haircut. You're welcome. There was another gaming-related show that was really similar to Game Farm, and that was Play 2Z, a show that is mostly lost to time, aside from this one video posted from Jago NASCAR that showed a bumper for Play 2Z as it advertised gameplay and challenges, behind-the-scenes access to the people behind the games, top fives, news, and more. I personally don't have any memory of it, all I remember is Game Farm, and maybe any memories of this I mistake for Game Farm, but right now, Play 2Z lives on as this advertisement of it. All we do know is that it was a show made for the Nickelodeon Gas channel, and it focused on video games. For something a little spooky, there was Scaredy Camp, a five-part series that premiered on the main Nickelodeon channel with reruns of it found on the Gas channel. It was labeled as a Survivor-like competition, and after this 12-hour video talking about 44 seasons of Survivor, I think I've good on Survivor for a while, but hey, that's just me. The kids that participated would work on teams looking for clues regarding some urban legend at the summer camp that they're at. The show ended up having a second season that was five parts as well, as here the teams were split up between boys and girls with them each trying to put a mysterious spirit to rest by solving the mystery overall. In order to do this, the teams would compete in challenges during the day with the winner getting a chance to go out at night and solve as much of what is going on as possible. It's your typical finding clues, unscrambling messages, and inspecting items or areas to start finding the answers needed type of mystery just done in a semi-competitive way. Is it truly that scary? No, not really. But was it scary for the kids trying to solve everything at night? Yeah, probably, so there's that. But even scarier than that show was a show called Top Spin. Here, have a look as to why. No, your computer or phone screen is working properly. There's just nothing here. Whatever this listed program was for the network seems to completely be lost to time. Top Spin, because of the name, seems to be based on tennis. Now, it may be a game show, it may be a docu-series, it may be someone spinning some tops like a Beyblade, but whatever it was didn't last long. It didn't get saved or recorded, and for all we know, may not even exist at all. Our only trace to it is from people like Mikhail Cataldo, who documented the Gas Channel's TV schedule schedule, showing that Top Spin would air on Sundays at 8pm and 11pm, at least as of January in 2003. Other than that, for 2003, the channel finally started airing episodes of Rocket Power to fill time on the network, but this cartoon would have fit in so well here from the beginning. Either way, it was on there finally, and that's all that matters, right? In 2004, another cartoon was added into the mix of programs for the Gas Channel, and that was Speed Racer X. Racing's a sport, anime was more popular than ever, thank you again, Toonami, and this was it. That was the end of the syndicated content, the reruns of classic programs, and even new made for Nickelodeon gas productions for the channel. The only other standout bits of special things for the channel were all the various programming blocks on gas that all had great names like Extreme Gas, or Pumping Gas, or even All Access Gas, just segmenting special shows together for their own mini blocks, theming it up in fun ways. The channel also introduced these interstitials called Trade Tricks. They would feature some athletes speaking to the audience to show off and or teach how to do what they do within their sport or hobby from bowling to basketball and even Scrabble. Yeah, who can forget the great sport of Scrabble, huh? And that's the base tour of what this, new for the time, Nickelodeon sister channel had to offer. The main goal of creating a more sports-oriented channel seemed to really be a half-baked effort in terms of what programs truly dominated this channel, as it became the dumping ground for all of the classic game shows for the most part. And for what it was, I enjoyed the network for preserving the continuation of viewers being able to watch the rerun somewhere before the internet really became the salvation for shows like that. Heck, it even introduced me to some I had never seen or knew much about thanks to not being born yet, or being too young to have known or remember them, but a big part of me wishes that the original version was stuck to a bit more when it came to the shows themselves. The smaller segments focusing on sports were fine and all that, it's just that there was too little in the original programming department to make it feel worth seeking out this channel. Most of the shows or specials that they 
had already, or at the same time, would be shown on Nickelodeon proper. So if you weren't into watching older game shows, what was the point of switching to the gas channel? If there was a gas programming block that ran for a couple hours on the main channel already, what was the point of switching to the gas channel? If the future of the channel was just going to become automated, what was the point of switching to the gas channel? And that last statement I said there is true, by the way. In 2005, the channel's daily programming became a fixed, unchanged list of shows every day, giving the illusion that Nickelodeon had given up on the channel and eventually would have quietly sunset it. This went on for two years, as on December 31st, 2007, the Games and Sports channel aired their final program under that name, finishing off with my favorite game show, Figure It Out, as the channel then disappeared, being replaced by the new sister channel of an already existing sister channel to Nickelodeon, called The End, which was a split off from the Noggin channel. Eventually, this would turn into what is known as the Team Nick channel now, although Nickelodeon Games and Sports lived on for a while in spirit, specifically through Dish Network, for over a year after the channel ended, with this existing channel under their housing being turned into a secondary Cartoon Network channel later on. Many years later, in 2019, Paramount's owned non-cable cable-like streaming service called Pluto TV had their own channel called Nick Games that had all the game shows similar to Nickelodeon Gas, but even this would go away, and some of those game shows would now live on the Pluto TV channel called Pluto TV Teen. The reason I hold Nickelodeon Gas so tightly in my memory is my own nostalgia of watching the channel, but not for the reasons the channel was made for in the first place. I love rewatching episodes of older game shows, but the major focus on sports never felt front and center like the channel seemed to be promising from the get-go. The logo, the mission statement, and the early deals made had you believe that Nickelodeon believed in a specific vision, but it quickly became a majority rerun channel with the largest focus being on games over sports. It did have some moments through special segments and a handful of shows that fit the mold and description of the sports side of things, but I guess either their initial research wasn't as promising as they thought, or they failed to execute on the promises they had built up. The aesthetics are there, the vibe of the channel was there, but the content didn't quite always match that. But I don't really care about traditional sports that much anyway, so that's really all I have to say on the matter. I was happy with the game shows. I do think there could have been a continued growth of this channel had they had the faith to keep producing more shows and more ideas specifically for the gas channel, rather than default back to the main channel for support. And maybe they truly did intend to, but the only thing we have to go on are the facts, and that is there simply wasn't a strong enough plan or focus to build the channel. Just getting comfortable playing reruns since it would cost a whole lot less than developing more and more new shows. Either way, I'd love to know if you have any memories associated with Nickelodeon games and sports, and what were some of your favorite programs that played on that channel. Tell me in the comments below. As always, I've been Jordan Fringe. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.